Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Doug O'Keefe, co-producer and host of Inside Leather History, a Fireside Chat. I produce these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I'm in the beautiful home of Alexei Romanov in Pasadena, California, on a beautiful sunny morning, and it's March 30th, 2019. Today is a distinct honor. I am interviewing a gentleman who goes way back in history, who's been part of a major uh, part of gay and lesbian history. Alexei Romanov was part of the original protest at the Black Cat in Los Angeles in 1967. Alexei has been interviewed extensively about the Black Cat protests, so we're only going to speak a little bit about that today. But we're going to speak a lot about his leather history, which is extensive, and his other community history, which is also beautiful and extensive. So, Alexei, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored, and I extend special thanks to you and to your wonderful husband, David. Thank so, tell us a little bit about uh, the black cat here. Who's this? Well, <clears throat> this looks like Felix the cat. There was a bar here in uh, Los Angeles in Silver Lake that call, was called the Black Cat. It became numerous <coughs> other names after it. Um, a couple of years back, we got it designated as a historical landmark. Mm -hmm. And that's because in, uh, I won't say the dates because I'm 82 years old and I'm, uh, I can forget dates and superimpose them. So uh -oh. I'm just going to say there was a raid on New Year's Eve at the Black Cat. And the police came in undercover. And after they played Old Lang Syne, there was two people who were kissing. At that time, two males could not kiss mm -hmm. in public. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't show any outward affection. Uh, it was very oppressive. So the, the gay bars were our places that we could go go into. There, there were no open windows. Everything was blacked out or heavy drapes over it. Some of the places you actually went into from the rear entrance, an alley, yeah. not to be seen. So we were, two people were kissing. It turned out that these un undercover police officers grabbed them and started beating them. They claimed they resisted arrest. It turned out it was a brother and sister and the sister was fairly masculinely mm. dressed. Mm. So when they were kissing, it looked like two men kissing in public. And that's where the melee started. Oh. Now there was another bar, <clears throat> it was called the New Faces. It, it was designated by the logo, Comedy and tra Tragedy. <clears throat> and there was someone who was going into the black cat, he was in a white dress and he saw what was going on and he ran out, ran down the block and police officers who were outside followed him oh. down and they went into the new faces. The One of the owners, I had owned part of uh, I was a part owner in the New Faces, was my partner, Leroy. Now, when I say that, the first thing you think of is a man. Yeah. Lee Roy. Her, that was her name. It wasn't Leroy. It was Lee, L-E-E-R-O-Y as a last name. They saw this person leaving the black cat. They followed him down to the bar. He went in there looking for sanctuary. He thought that this was a riot or something. And when the police came in undercover and said, 
who is the owner or manager of this bar, they saw this woman, Leroy, L-E-E-R-O-Y as a last name, in a white dress. That, and they mistook her for the man who ran down the block. Oh. They broke her collarbone that night. They beat her severely. The bartender started to come across the bar because he saw his manager or owner being beat. They grabbed him and they beat him and they ruptured. Uh, they, he ended up in the hospital that night and so did Leroy. That's yeah. thinking that this was gay people. So a couple of years back now, we had the black cat designated as a historical landmark. We may have a photo of that. Let I me have find a it. photo of yeah. that. Yeah. And it's, we had it declared a historical landmark. And they, the committee that awards these things asked us why we wanted that. I said, so in 50 years from now, because I intend to be alive that much longer. Good. Maybe some young person who may be 16, 17, or 18 asks, where did my civil rights start? They will be able to go to a location as the straight community and the pro has pride in Gettysburg, Selma, Alabama, Bunker Hill. This gay person can go to a location where there is a plaque. Yeah. Now, we also had another thing designated. There was an organization early in gay rights that was called the Manishan Society. And I got to tell you what the Manishan was. Originally, with the kings and queens in Europe, nobody could tell them what was right and wrong. So they had a jester, and he was called the Manishan. And he would be able to speak to the king of what he's doing wrong. Oh. And they, during the <clears> McCarthy <throat> era, they demonstrated in Washington across from the White House and all. And, but their requirement was that if you were a woman, you had to have a dress. If you were a woman, you either had, you had to look like a, a woman and all men had to have suits on if they were going to go protest. <clears throat> well, they did protest against McCarthy and all. And they were a good, good thing. There are steps off of Silver Lake here in Los Angeles to go up to where their meeting hall, their meeting house was. Okay. There. And the founder of their organization owned the house. So... One of the things we did is those steps had a street number. Okay. So we went to the city council and we got them <clears throat> to authorize the renaming of those streets that are called the Manishan Society Steps. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing. So they could be remembered. What feelings did you have when you were at the Black Cat for the dedication. What was going through your mind? Finally, we're acknowledged, not me, our community, as being human beings and as being a necessity in life and that we have full rights under our constitution the same rights that any other person. Well, we're achieving it somewhat here in California. We now have the right to vote the way we want to vote because we get the candidates that we want to elect yeah. who not only support us, 
support the Latino, support the black, support all the other communities that certain people in this country want to put to the side again. Yeah. We're not second class citizens, we're first class citizens. We vote, we pay taxes, we work, and all of that. When you were fighting to, bring, to make this happen, to, to bring the historical designation to the black cat, did you have resistance? How did other people feel about that? You know, in, at this particular time, if, if they're political, they don't particularly, well, I won't say all, because in Washington, they don't particularly want to show intolerance. Yeah. Because they want to get elected. So, it's, it's a matter of, I don't care if you like me, you got to respect my rights. Yeah. You got to respect my constitutional rights. I met a man 20 something years ago. We were the first two, we were in a fr in, on the front cover of Frontiers, which was a magazine here in Los Angeles, because we were the f first two to sign up for domestic partnership. Oh. We didn't have marriage then. <clears throat> but we had domestic partnership at that point. And we went, they had this mass signing with all of these notary publics there. And uh, we ended up on the front of frontiers. Okay. And we also were amongst the 18,000 when California offered marriage to get married oh. in there. And then they try to take it away from us. Yes. And they couldn't do it. But we have, <clears throat> this is a wonderful state, as there are many other wonderful states. But this is a wonderful state. Not all of it accepts us. But a lot of it, they tolerate us. And a lot of them absolutely accept us. Yeah. So, and... My partner, who was so supportive, David and I, we've been together for more than 20 years. How beautiful. And uh, as I age, I'm happy. My life is happy. I look back on what I do and what I did. And I'm proud of myself because I talk to any young people that are willing to listen. Because if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. That's the truth. Let's take a big step back before you came to Los Angeles. You're from New York City. In the 1950s, you were exploring the gay scene of New York. I heard that it was an amazing scene. Tell us a little bit about that. What did you experience? Well, I was very young. My mother was in show business. <clears throat> and we had a little group of eight young, young people. And we called ourselves the Trunkers. Now, that's from the saying, born in a trunk. Uh. So we, call, we called ourselves the Trunkers. And when our family, when our parents, if they were, were performing, on Broadway, we would go up 42nd Street to Bryant Park and hang out there and sit there. And it's a very, it was a very different park then. It's right behind the library in New York. Okay. And one of the things was, it was bushy and you were protected there and so on and so forth and you could talk and everything and get away from the city a little bit. And we would go up there and sit there. And at that time, there was this man, and I get a little sentimental and choked up with this, who would come to the park almost every day. He was 86 years old, which doesn't seem quite as old to me now, 
as it did then. And he would sit there and tell us what it was like in 1890 to be gay. Wow. And I would sit there and listen to him. And he said, I came from a small town, and I can't remember what town he mentioned, but he said, if the police found out that you were gay, they would come by your house or somewhere that they knew you would be, and they would beat you every night with clubs and with blackjacks things. And he was telling us they didn't want to put us in jail they just didn't want us there. So if they made it hard enough for you to live there, you would go somewhere else. And where is a somewhere, somewhere else? A big city where you're really anonymous. Yeah. And that brought him to New York with that. And he's, he was a wonderful person. He was 86, and I'm 82 right now and proud of it. And I intend to go along a long ways more. But he was 86, and we would go down on 42nd Street, walk down past Broadway to a place called Horn and Harlots. It was an automat. It was a place where it was a whole row of things that you would put coins in, open the compartment, and take your food out. Yeah. But there was someone behind it. It was freshly cooked. Someone behind it, put it, replacing it each time someone took it. And we were sitting there, the eight of us and him, at, we would have water, sodas, a little coffee or tea or something. And we were sitting there, and he said, you know, when you're my age and ready to leave this earth, if you haven't left your community, and the world as a whole in a better place than you found it. You haven't lived. Wow. And I sat there. Now, all eight of us didn't get it. But I sat there and I looked up at him. And I says, wow, just like you did. Yeah. It was so precise and distinct of what he was telling me, that I didn't want to waste my life. Yeah. We couldn't get an apartment, two men together, or a room. Apartments weren't big. Nothing's big in New York City. And I had a, a partner at the time. This is a little later. I was older. Okay. And... <clears throat> I did started doing little things of activism and stuff like that, and I was going to school, and I would go in and sit in Greenwich Village. I would go out and sit on the boulevard and sell my artwork. Oh. But I, I used to go around to the second-hand stores. They were thrift shops in those days, but they were called second-hand stores. And I'd buy up all of the silverware that was sterling silver. I had a mallet, I had an anvil, and I had a punches and things, and I would beat that, all those forks and knives and things, into jewelry. Oh, okay. And I would go down to lower Manhattan, way down, and there was a place that made prosthesis eyes, that's artificial eyes, and the ones that didn't match the other eye, they would sell. So I would buy them like 75 cents for a dozen of them in those days. And I would beat those eyes into my jewelry that I made, wristbands, necklaces, and things like that. So I, you, typically village sales stuff, I would have the things that they would buy them from me. Okay. And I sat on, on a, uh, a little chair and a, a table I set up. And I sat next to a man, and this could be researched because he's famous. He was called Moon Doggy. He was an, he would play. He was blind, and he would play instruments, drums, and things like that. 
I sat next to him there, because we each had our own little space yes. on the boulevard. And I would sell my stuff. I also did a little artwork at the time. I would take slate, piece of slate. I would do the primitive paintings from France oh, okay. and from Europe of the primitive men like that, the blow paintings and sure. things sure. on this. And I would take the slate, I'd break it into pieces, and then I'd put it in a compression frame, and I would go up and sell <laughs> Neanderthal paintings. <laughs> there we go. Not that they were real, but I'll get back to the other subject. Okay. Did New York the Core Club was on 72nd Street. There was another one, the Cafe Bally on 86th, and there was a big restaurant kind of like where you got your food up at a counter that uh, everybody used to go into up there on Broadway after the bars closed. So that was the place to go. And they closed at four in the morning. Oh, wow. And at the time, there were no very few driver's licenses in New York City, though there was traffic, but not in our community and not that young. And you had to be 18 years old to go to the bars. So what they used to ask was for your draft card, because oh, you had to register oh, okay. as for the draft after 18. And I borrowed a draft card so I could get into the bars wow. from a friend. Well, I didn't realize he was a friend, but he was 29 years old. And I walked in, the doorman said, where's your draft card? And I handed him the draft card. He looked at it, and it said 29. And he looked at me, and he says, God bless you. Here, uh, go on like that. But that's a little bit of the nature of what the bars were yeah. and all. Of course, <clears throat> there were very few bars that were owned by gay people. Yeah. They were mainly family bars. And you knew what family they belonged to by the name of the bar, the golden pheasant, the uh, yellow parrot, or whatever it was at the time. And uh, so I used to go to Artie's Cafe, the town cafe, and all of these places, even before I was of age. But I'd like to tell you a story about get, in New York City, when you, I had a partner who was almost, around my own age. And uh, I was in a laundromat because nobody has room for a washing machine and dryer in their homes. I was in a laundromat. They had cork boards. And there was a little advertisement on it that said, small apartment for rent with a view of the river. They didn't say the Hudson River or the East River. And I saw that, and I called my partner up. I said, we've been wanting to move in together. Why don't we go see this place? He said, yeah. So he met me after he was off of work and all. We went to this. Most landlords lived on the premises that they were rented. OK. Yeah. And they would have like the front apartment or something like that. And <clears throat> there were no leases. You paid the first month's rent, and they gave you the key. So, but two men, two women could rent together, but two men could not. Oh, wow. They wouldn't rent to two men. You were gay if you wanted to live together, unless you were related. So we used to go in when we wanted to get an apartment together. And we would say, we're half-brothers. We have two different last names because we had different fathers yeah. but the same mother. We got around things. <laughs> anyway, I went in. We looked. Well, a view of the river was if you climbed out on the fire escape. New York City, all the buildings are required to have fire escape. If you climb out on the fire escape and you leaned about two feet over through this little crack, you saw about two inches of 
river. Yeah. But the place was nice and comfortable, so we decided we were going to take it. We went back down to him. We said we saw it, or like it, and we'd like to take it. And he turned around and he says, what's the relationship between the two of you? And I stopped for a minute, and I looked at my partner. I looked back at him, and I said, he's my partner and my lover. And he, I looked back at my partner at the time. He was as white as a goat. His mouth was hanging open and looked at me as though to say, what the hell have you just done? And I only bring this up because of I wanted people to know what it was like. Yeah, yeah. What have you just done? And the landlord then says to me, he says, well, can you afford this place? I said, yeah, I work part time. I'm out on the boulevard. I study for school and I sell my paintings and my jewelry on the boulevard. And yeah, and he looked at me and he said, okay, here's the key. No, first he asked for the first month's rent. Then he says, here's the key. And he told me, you know, when rent would be due each yes. month. Yes. And I looked at my partner and he was like stunned. And then I looked back and I tears came to my eyes. And I looked up and I said, thank you, Mother Brian. I will never lie about being gay again in my life. But if someone doesn't ask me, I don't walk around saying I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, you know. But every time I've been asked in my life, are you gay or are you a homosexual? I've said yes. Wow. That's beautiful. And that's the story of Mother Brian. Did New York City have leather bars in those days or is that before they had them? There were bars that, not that people wore leather, but the leather culture was there. So, Alexei, tell me about the bars in New York. I understand you actually had an amazing experience. Being yeah, I, <clears throat> I went into I went into a bar, and. I believe it was called a cork club. Cork club. Cork. Cork. Okay. Cork club, on Seventy Second Street. I think I mentioned it before. Okay. And uh, I got to meet some people, and people of my own age, which was underage, to be in a bar. And I went home with somebody. I'll just use that term. Oh, wow. And we tripped. Okay. And then I came back to the bar at another time, and uh, he he saw me sitting with another person, and he got jealous. Very jealous. And I was I was there, and I was getting ready. We were going to leave, and he said he stopped me from leaving. And he says to me, where do you think you're going? And I said, I don't know if it's your business. And he said to me, we're a couple. And I said, no, we're not. Now, the difference between, in case you don't know, between tricking and being a couple is that you've got a dedicated relationship, yep. and tricking you don't. I said, and he said, I said, no, we don't. And he says, you're mine. And I says, no, I'm not. I'm nobody's. <laughs> so we spent a little more time, and I talked to the owner of the bar a little bit, because he was, and he came over, he says, hey, guys, just settle down, you know. And I says, well, I'm going to be leaving. And he says, wait a few minutes and then take off. They had, you said they had, you said they threw him out of the bar already? I believe they had thrown him out of the bar. Okay. And uh, 
I got out the door, and uh, all of a sudden I felt I heard a bang, and I felt a stinging in the back of my neck here. Oh. I still have the scar here oh. from it. And of course, the owner of the club or manager of the club there came running out, and they took me back into the club and all. And the, uh, he said, we're not going to call the police because they were afraid of, of what might happen with the bar, wow. the problem. He says, if you will allow us to take you to our doctor, he'll take care of you, and the rest of the time you come into this bar, anything you want is free. Oh, okay. And you will never see that gentleman again. Wow. Now, now, I didn't know what it meant, but to this day, I've never seen him again. I went to their doctor, which was a family doctor, you okay. know, yes. and uh, I went there, and they, <clears throat> they paid me some money because I ha couldn't work the next day. And that, and they, uh, and I never saw him again. Wow. So, wow. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know <laughs> anything about that. But that was my first experience of anything like that, and that was out of a gay bar. Wow. So you you took old Route sixty six. You left uh, New York. New York down forty. Okay. To, I think it was Missouri. And I took 66 from one side all the way to California. All the way out here. Yeah. And at that day, at that time, it wasn't like when you went to every different little city, there was a, and I'm not saying anything about Home Depot. There was a Home Depot, <laughs> a Lowe's, or one of the standard coffee shops or food places, a McDonald's or something like that. Each place you went to was totally different. And I got to see what it was like in the rest of the country and how nice the people were. You know, they seemed to be trusting and really nice. I, I, I went in a 1949 Pontiac Chieftain. Yeah, thank gosh. A convertible, fire engine red. And to just say how young I was, I took all of the lights in my dash out and I put a cellophane around them, a saran around them okay. that, that was red. So my entire dash was red. Oh. And I had the convertible, which was fire engine red with the chieftain's head on the front wow. of it, the ornament. And uh, was coming across country. We stopped for breakfast in a place. And I had a German Shepherd dog with me, which was my dog, <clears throat> with a friend, Bruce. And I didn't, I didn't want to have the dog shipped or anything like that, because that was difficult in those days. So we fixed up my back seat. So it was a board that was all padded. And it held the water bowl and a food bowl okay. there so that the dog had things. And we came across country. So we went in to eat somewhere. I'm just showing how nice people are. We went across country, and she, some woman, when we were going to pay our check to go out, the woman behind the cash register said, said to me, is that your dog out there? I said, yeah. She said, oh, your dog is beautiful. I said, oh, thank you. She says, wait here a minute. She went into the kitchen. She came out with this bucket, you know, a bucket. It had ham bones. Oh. It had meat that was left over, cuts of little pieces of meat. And my dog enjoyed that bone almost all the way across country Fantastic. like that. But I want to say how nice people can be, yeah. Yeah. you know. And I got to see, I got to put my foot on that spot where you stand in four states or three oh, states. Yes, what, yes, yes. Everybody does that. And I had things that happened. Now, one thing that was funny coming to California was that 
we stopped in Death Valley. And we, I had to go to the bathroom, and it was a ways there. Also, we had picked up water on those things that you hung in the front of your car. It kept it cool, because oh. we didn't know how big Death Valley was. And I went down. They had these little bridges over the, the washers. And I was going to the bathroom, relieving myself. And I heard this, and I thought, rattlesnake. So I didn't stop to pull my pants up or anything. I was up the side of that hill. People were pushing their kids down in the cars, oh, in their cars, and going by. And I said to Bruce, there was a rattlesnake down there. He said, I've never seen a rattlesnake. New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah. So we came down, we went back, and we looked. It was a, a seed pod on a plant that was oh. right next. But anyway, that's the kind of experiences we had that was fun. So tell us about coming here to... Uh California and the bar scene in Silver Lake at that time. Okay. I had a friend, a boyhood friend, Steve, <clears throat> who lived half of the time in California and half of the time in New York, New Jersey. Okay. And uh, his, his mother and father were divorced. <clears throat> his father lived here in California in Paramount. And his mother lived in... New Jersey at, at that time. And so he spent time here. I called him up that snowy morning where they couldn't dump any more ice or snow into the East River or the Hudson River. And I said to him, I'm watching a kinescope recording yeah. which here, and I've decided I'm going to move to California next year. I wanted to make plans to go. And he had lived here. I said, where would be a good place to come to? He said, Silver Lake. And I said, Silver Lake? I've never heard of it. He says, it's a section of Los Angeles, and there's a lot of gay people there and lesbians. I put, the, and lesbians, at that time it was gay girls oh, okay. and gay men, and the women were butchers or femmes, and the men were, you know, mm -hmm which the leather community keeps to a degree, to a degree yeah. you know. And uh, so I made my plans, and I, I said to Bruce, who was a friend of mine back there, I'm going to California next year. And he says, why do you want to do that? I said, I want to get away. I had lost a lover a year before, a year, not a year, but about six months before to cancer. So, and it wasn't the plague, it was, the, it was cancer. Yeah. And he died fairly quick, and we had been together since high school. Wow. And uh, so I saw this kinescope with the palm trees, new freeways, the sun shining when I'm stuck in the middle of snow. And I said, I'm going there. And then I told Bruce, and Bruce said, a little while later, he called me back. He says, can I go with you? I says, sure, I'd love to have somebody with me. So anyway, we did that trip, and we got into Silver Lake. And it was so refreshing. Everything was so clean and neat. Uh, okay. Now, the bars in New York were very different than they are here. How so? <clears throat> They were less specific to you, the, your style. Oh, okay. You know, there was, there was Lenny's Hideaway, some of the other bars that are famous, you know, for things. And it just, there was a different feeling. Now, I, I enjoyed the bars in New York. I'm not saying that. But I would say I made more friends when I came here quickly. Okay. You know, People in New York are very nice people. Yes. They are. But they're a little standoffish until they get to know you. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and I think I had that tendency at that time, too. But you very quickly found a home for yourself. Oh, here. yes. 
And you are one of the founding members of Avatar. Yes. Please tell that us. That was about a number of years later. Oh, okay. But that was after the the after Black Cat. Black Cat right? and Protests. New Faces, the protests okay. and the other things. Uh, what what it was is I was living in Silver Lake. My first week of being there, I met at the time a Mr. California. Mm, okay. Weightlifter, so and so okay. forth. And that was interesting. It was the first time I was picked up <laughs> on the street. <laughs> anyway. Fun. And yeah, and he said to me, he said, I'd like I told him I'm brand new from New York. And I'd like to uh, he said, I'd like to show you the bars, because I knew nothing about the bars. So he took me around that night. We went out to dinner, and he took me into Hollywood. He took me into Silver Lake, and then on Melrose, that was a span of bars. That's a street in yes. West Hollywood. Yes. Hollywood. And uh, we, we went to a dance club called the Apache, and all the waiters wore little loincloths uh, and, of course, shoes, but that's all yeah, okay. like that. And for a while there, they had a feather and all, but some people found that offensive. So they did away with the feather but kept the loincloth. All right, sounds good. And uh, there was dancing there and all. There was another place out here that was called the Canyon Club. It was on... Laurel Canyon. It was like a little resort. You had to have a membership to go in. There was a huge dance floor that was a restaurant early in the evening, and then they took the tables away and put them up on the side, and there was a big dance floor. And there were two jukeboxes. And you, I wondered why there were two of them until... One of them, we were out on the floor. I was with a lesbian, Camille, and we were dancing. And all of us, and men were dancing with men, women were dancing with women. One jukebox went off and the other one went on. Hmm. And everybody changed partners without a word said. Huh. The women went with the men and the men went with the women and they started dancing to the new. To the new. Yes. And what it was, the Canyon Club had this thing that if that jukebox went on, that meant that the, the not the police, but the sheriffs okay. were coming in to look around. And it had to look like a legitimate business. Yes. But that's a little bit of what California was. Tell us a bit about Avatar being one of the founding members of that, because Avatar is so iconic and it's so important to our history. Yeah. There are three of us left who are the founding members okay. there. Uh, because of the plague, AIDS, yes. and because of our ages. Yes. And we were going to a rap group held by Guy Baldwin, and we were ragging, and we were saying about, you know, yeah, the leather bars, there's Larry's, there's all of this, and uh, a, a number of leather bars, I mean, about five at that time, or six, and uh, we were ragging about the, the uh, that there's nothing much to do to socialize and that, other than the bars. And uh, Guy Baldwin looked at us, there were I think three of us at the time, or four, four. And he said, uh, then why don't you do something about it? There you go. So we got together, Dan McCune, myself, Jason Whitman, and and we started to think about it. And that's the birth of Avatar. What do you feel Avatar has accomplished? Coming out of the closet in our own gay community. Fellowship. 
knowing that other people have something in common with you. And I happened to get David, my husband. Your husband, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you told me earlier, when we were speaking before we began actually filming, you knew Harvey Milk. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about personally knowing this man. He's well, uh, so I, I, I wasn't a buddy of his. Oh, I uh, understand that. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, I, I met him. We talked. He had a camera shop up in the Castro. Yes. He was a very outward going person. If you mm. were cute, he didn't mind saying, hey, ah. what, are, what are you doing tonight, cutie? You know, or something like that. And a uh, very friendly person. Okay. Very friendly. And I, I got the, the understanding that I said, uh, we talked a little bit, isn't it maybe a danger to be so open and, you know, because we were still, that's when the Castro was started. I see, yes. You know, and he was a very outward going person. And then when they, it happened and the riots happened up there afterwards, see, he expected that something might happen to him, yeah. but he never expected it to come from within City Hall. You guard yourself about with things. And he wasn't a guarded person. I mean, like I said, he was the type of person that he says he would say to you if he wanted it, how about a kiss? Mm. You know? And I have, I was so tickled when they put out, the post office put out the Harvey Milk stamps so that I bought a whole thing of it and I had it framed oh. to remember him. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And, uh, you know, there was, we had things in common because we had common goals okay. of acceptance, not being closeted anymore. You know, when I first came out, if you were considered gay, it was a mental disorder. Right. They could chemically castrate you. They could do shock treatments on you. Your family could have you confined. But not only that, that was what killed the man that had the decoder, the, the decoded the... Yeah. 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 They, they, because he was a homosexual, they, were, they chemically castrated him for him to stay out of jail. He died from that. But coming coming back I, to I, here, yes. well, I, I overlooked a little bit here. Um, exploratorium, which was I gather part of Avatar. Please tell us about that. What was it that? was? It was a. We were in a hall, we had, to, so we did demonstrations there. No one was allowed to ask questions or to interrupt anything, but there was these scenes okay. going on of what BDSM is about. And most people don't really understand it. It's not what they think it is. That's right. In fact, I, I did door duty there. This is after Avatar became a club, and we were doing fairly well. I want to talk about, at the beginning, it was Dan McCune, myself, and so on and so forth. There was a man, Peter Viros, who at that time, now I don't know if it was the plague, but the early form of the plague, he was artistic, he was very getting, get things done, and he, went, he was a designer, and he went, he designed our logo. Oh, okay. The logo was the first letter of the Sanskrit alphabet, the A, okay. avatar. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's two of them. The first letter symbolizes a higher power. And it's a deity that comes down to earth when man is in trouble and we were coming into our community. 
So he designed the Avatar logo, which I guess you've seen. Yes. You know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And he went, he had the patches, some patches, samples made, brought us back, back to the club, gave us three choices, and without a doubt, the founding members thought that that, that would represent us perfectly. And uh, so we voted on the three different choices. He went back, he had those patches made for us. That week he died. And I had to go, I picked them up. He got the patches, the name things, and all like that, all ordered, and I had to go and pick them up. And he died that week. My God. Wow. And so every time I still do orientation for new members when they come in, I take a picture of him out, I have it, and I tell them who he was and what he did. And he was the one that brought Avatar to us, the name. Okay. Yeah. So we originally were 15 members. That was considered the core. And then there were associate members after the core. In order for an associate to go into the core membership, somebody had to leave the core. Oh. It stayed 15 all the time. Okay. Now, we had the gray braid on our right shoulder or the red braid. The core was the red braid and the associate members wore the gray braid until they could join in to the core. Right. Well, there was a little uprising about that. So there was a there was a kind of an argument about it, you know, and uh, they felt less than because they weren't core, that we shouldn't be just a core of people at making all the decisions. And uh, so we did away with associate membership and made it all members. Oh, I see. Yeah, so now an avatar member is an avatar member. And <laughs> with that, then came the next argument. <coughs> Would we use the gray braid or the red braid? Oh, boy. Imagine that. Now, if you're a top or a master, you wear the gray braid on your left. Okay. If, same as your keys, you know. If you're a bottom or a slave or whatever, and a slave doesn't mean the same thing it did to other ethnic groups, or a slave, you wear it on the right side, just like you did. Remember, there was a key code at yeah. one time. Yeah. Left, top, right, bottom. Yeah. And that's... Uh, so... But we, did, we got this thing from San Francisco, the Exploratorium. There's a thing up there that you could go into the, I forget what the hall is, it's out near the ruins there. And, it, and they, you go through all of these different scenes of things that they teach you about it and everything. Yes. So we decided to have the Avatorium Exploratorium, Avatar Exploratorium. You were forced to change the name, though. Because they, they were going to sue us. Who was? The people who had the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Okay. Okay. Evidently, they had it patented and oh, copywritten or whatever, oh, okay. like that. So we had to change the name. And there I met my husband uh -huh. at one of the Exploratoriums. He came in. He looked at me. I looked at him. Well, a year before, he walked in to the same thing uh, to see it. And it was he was with a Los Angeles County Sheriff. Oh. And That's I... fun already. And I, I looked at him, and I said, because I had to ask, could I put my hands on you? 
anyone who came in. I'm not an officer of the law. So, so I said, can I put my hands on you? Can I search you? He said, yeah. So I'm searching him, and I went down, and I got to here, and I went, is that a gun? And he says, yeah. And, and my husband, David, was with him that year before, leaned over to me, and I, I, what I said, is that a gun? He said to me, no, he's just happy to see you. <laughs> And so I had to go to my board and say, is this okay, he's coming in? He's a sheriff, he's required to carry a gun with him 24 hours a day. So a year later, we're having the Exploratorium. My turn. <laughs> David, uh, I'm doing duty again, because we always worked in the club and worked hard. Right, you know, and I enjoyed that the contact with everybody who came in. And I, I'm up in the front. David walks in the door, and I said, "Can I search you?" And he says, "What do you think I'm hiding? I've got tennies on, I've got shorts, and I've got a sweatshirt on. What do you think I'm hiding?" And I says, "I'll find out." <laughs> and so. <clears throat> They're made a match in heaven. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, that's, but that's what we do, and that's what we did. We, were, we have a function coming up in the near future. How do you feel Avatar has evolved over the years? Well, a number of us have gotten older. That happens, yeah. <laughs> I think it's finding its way. It's not exactly the same as when it started, nor do I expect it to be. You know, I'm not the same as when I started. But, you know, I, I've had experiences in my life, hurtful and joyous. And if you accept that, that some things are going to hurt and some things are joyous, mm -hmm. you can live a much better life. As I said to the kids a couple of years back, I was on the Founders Float at CSW. That's our gay pride out here. And uh, afterwards, they had me go on to the main stage to talk to the people. And I looked down, and there were two or 3,000 young faces looking up at me from the dance floor probably wanting me to be off stage as quick as possible and back to the music. But I looked at them, and the first thing I felt to say was, hello, family. Uh. And they went crazy clapping. I said, you know, we have gained some rights. If you don't use them, you'll lose them. That's right. And they went crazy. And that was talking to all those people. I had talked to more people in that one day than I probably have talked in my whole time now. And that was, that was it. And CSW honored me as a founder. Fantastic. You know, and it was our, the raids that we had, the demonstration here yes. that we had. That's a black cat. Black cat. You don't see anyone smiling on this picture. They were afraid they were going to be outed. They would lose their jobs. They'd lose their livelihood and their homes. But they showed up anyway. Yeah. Two years ago, we duplicated this picture with the mayor of Los Angeles and the city councilman. I'd like to share these two really quickly because I think these are very indicative of the history that you're sharing with me today and with whomever may be watching this video. This is a photo of you when the plaque was yeah, when we uh, had dedicated a... to the black cat here in Los Angeles. 
they had me unveil it. Yes. That's a wonderful photo. And here... And one thing I just want to mention. Yes. Right now, I w went down there a, a couple of months ago, and someone put a card up here, oh. and it said, thank you. Oh, yes. Right up here in the corner. Someone put something there. This one is a, a beautiful photo that your, your husband David shared, and I'd like to... Oh, here it is. Here's the card. Oh, I see. Yeah. But this photo your husband David shared, and I, I think this is a beautiful photo indic indicative of who you are and what you've done for us as a community fighting for what's right. Isn't that, uh, isn't that David there with you? Isn't yes, right? he's okay. next to me, and right my dearest friend Tom is next to him. Yeah, with your black cat shirts. I love it. Yeah. 